Hello Thoreau fans and self-taught scholars. Corrine Smith here with what has become a tradition in this video series and that's considering the new books about Henry David Thoreau that came out in this calendar year 2023. And it has been a busy one. We have six main non-fiction books to talk about today and then of course I'll throw in some other stuff uh, after we get to them. And we're going to approach those six main books in alphabetical order by the author's last names and not by the date of their release. <clears throat> be warned, I'm going to be snarky and picky today. What can I say? I thought I'd let you know in advance. Only when it's appropriate to be so, I'll be snarky and picky. First up then is Lawrence Buell's book, Henry David Thoreau, Thinking Disobediently. I have heard Larry say that this is the shortest biography he's ever written, which is a good point a thin volume, chock full of stuff though, and I wouldn't call it a biography either. I consider it instead to be a fresh reconsideration of Thoreau's lives and works because you should know all the facts about his life and his writings before you step into this book so that you can understand the points that Larry makes and so that they make more sense to you. I can't summarize his premise any more than that. It's a great review. It's a good reminder of what Henry David Thoreau was all about. Okay, I was a little bothered by the fact that he kept refer referring to the essay as civil disobedience. By that title, even though we all know that's not the original title, Thoreau never coined that phrase, yada, yada, yada. Larry does mention the original uh, title, Resistance to Civil Government, somewhere in the middle of the book once, but I don't know, every time I saw civil disobedience, I, coming from professor, I thought, eh. but your results may differ. Put that aside. Nevertheless, Henry David Thoreau, Thinking Disobediently by Lawrence Buell. The last chapter is exceptionally good, and at the end, Larry gives you an extensive bibliography of other books you should read, so you could use this one as a jumping off point for basically embarking on a lifetime of Thoreauvian reading. Yes. Thank you, Larry. Next up, we have Henry at Work, Thoreau on Making a Living by John Kegg and Jonathan Van Bell. Two philosophers considering what Thoreau thought about work, what work he did, what work he resigned from or deliberately avoided altogether, and how we other humans may follow similar paths or not. Okay, interesting subject matter about work using Thoreau as a foundation, presented in a surprisingly informal and chatty way coming from a Princeton University Press book. The authors often put themselves right into the narration. They're not biographers, they're not historians, and so early on they get some facts wrong. For example, um, when Thoreau retreats to Walden Pond, it is, Walden Pond is two miles from his native Concord, Massachusetts. Okay, so that's a sticking point. Walden Pond is in Concord, Massachusetts. It's within the borders of the town. So he didn't leave, he didn't leave his hometown to go to Walden. Okay, maybe that's a sticking point, but you're writing a book, you, you kind of should know. Um, they also talk about, um, well, the present day Colonial Inn in Concord Center. You see it there. You can see that there are three specific this is an old postcard, three specific parts to the building. Thoreau's grandfather owned this part, uh, and that's where his maiden aunts, Thoreau's maiden aunts lived uh, uh, during his lifetime, and the Thoreau family lived there as well uh, a little bit. So they, do, they did say the eastern parts, the northeastern part, that's where his grandfather um, owned. But then they also said that's where the tavern is today in the hotel, and that's not true. The tavern's in the sun. Okay, it's, it's little things like that that oh, bother me because if you get those wrong, what else are you not paying attention to? They also said, um, they, they brought out the Amish and Amish simplicity, which I often do being from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, but they say Thoreau was neither a pacifist nor a Christian. Whoa. Wasn't a Christian? Uh... I think people could debate that. 
you could probably write a whole book about debating that. Um, I'm, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. It's one of the things that kind of bothered me in here. But anyway, it's not that the authors didn't have the facts available to them either, because they do quote Laura Dossal Walls and Robert Richardson's biographies. Um, but my lesson here is... As I've told some other folks who have shown me manuscripts about what they're writing about Thoreau, you really have to watch how you summarize and boil things down. You can't tell the whole life. You've got to summarize, but you have to watch how far down you condense the facts because you can get so narrow that you end up with a statement that is totally wrong. I, it doesn't sound like that's possible, but if you're a writer, you might understand that. I've, I've seen this I've seen that happen. I, you know, I've had to avoid that myself. If I had seen this manuscript in progress, that's what a advice I would have given these guys. Uh, so, but to be fair, Larry Buell also glosses over some things that I wish he hadn't glossed over. Not to the point of being in error, but still, you can't tell it all. So you have to watch how you tell it. I guess is is the is the story here. Okay. Intriguing food for thought here, Henry, at work. Um, makes us think about the values of our own working lives, especially since the book seems to focus a lot on the drudgery and meaningless kind of work. And the authors seem to know a lot of workers who, quite frankly, are leading lives of quiet desperation, may not even know it, <clears throat> may know it, and not admit it. Um, anyway, what about those of us who find value in what we're doing? Hmm. Not sure. They, we may be left out of the equation. Anyway, Henry at Work, her Thoreau on Making a Living by John Kegg and Jonathan Van Bell. And then Robert Richardson, the last book from Robert Richardson, uh, Three Roads Back. Uh, also, yeah, Rich, yeah, Robert Richardson, Three Roads Back, How Emerson Thoreau and William James Responded to the Greatest Losses of Their Lives. A little book dealing with grief which is a subject matter that is often on people's minds these days. And in this case, Robert Richardson first sent this manuscript to Megan Marshall when he found out that she had lost her partner. Uh, so it's appropriate that Megan wrote the foreword to this finally published book. Uh, Robert Richardson passed away in 2020. As you know, Emerson and Thoreau lost a a number of family members and friends to diseases that were untreatable at the time. The focus here is on Emerson's mourning of his first wife, Ellen, Thoreau's grief at losing his brother, John, who died in his arms. For William James, it was the death of his close cousin, Minnie Temple, that had an impact on him. And Richardson was the biographer for each one of these authors, so he was able to condense their experiences into this single work. It's an easy read, has many relevant um, quotes from those writers themselves, and it does offer generous food for thought. Thanks again to both Megan Marshall and Richard, Robert Richardson for Three Roads Back. Then we have Thoreau's Acts, Distraction and Discipline in American Culture by Caleb Smith. And the whole premise for this book is based on one line or one sentence or one episode from Walden where Thoreau is um, fixing his axe and he is temporarily distracted by, from his work, work again, uh, by seeing a snake slithering by. And he, so here's the snake. We don't have the axe except in words. Here's the snake, okay? And so this book is a compendium of quotes from 28 writers about how distracted we humans can be, how little we pay attention, how much discipline we need in our lives. Uh, many of the writers cited are from the 19th century. Thoreau is one of them. Uh, so one of the chapters is devoted to him, and he's also mentioned profusely in the introduction since he is the inspiration for this book. You'll recognize other names here like Emily Dickinson, Herman Melville, Edgar Allan Poe, Walt Whitman. <clears throat> we even come up to our own times with Toni Morrison, and that's Thoreau's Axe by Caleb Smith. Again, food for thought. And actually, thinking about this now, you could actually pair these two books together because they're both about work, in a way, and ways that people have of avoiding it. All right? So there you go. 
There's a, a pair of them for you. Let me take take my tea. You keeping up? Making a list? By the way, there's links below. There's links below. All of these books are available from the Thoreau Society shop at Walden Pond. Um, and um, there are links below so you can get them. Thoreau's Botany is next, Thinking and Writing with Plants by James Perrin Warren. I admittedly, I have not had a chance to read this one yet, so I'll have to read to you from the summary on the back. Thoreau's last years have been the subject of debate for decades, but only recently have scholars and critics begun to appreciate the posthumous publications, unfinished manuscripts, and journal entries that occupied the writer after Walden. Until now, no critical reader has delved deeply enough into botany to see how Thoreau's plant studies impacted his thinking and writing. Thoreau's botany moves beyond general literary appreciation for the botanical works to apply Thoreau's extensive studies of botany from 1850 to his death in 1862 to readings of his published and unpublished works in fresh interdisciplinary ways. Great. So obviously focuses on botanical studies and onward from there. Looking through the book and at the table of contents, <clears throat> I can see what's covered here. It considers and includes the plants that Thoreau saw and documented during his trips to Maine, during his trips to Cape Cod, and when he lived at Walden. The details that he kept in his annual calendar with the K, you know that one, where they can prove climate change now by looking at his facts and figures. And the notes that he made that eventually showed up as dispersion of seeds and wild fruits. It's all good stuff. I can't wait to dive into it. <clears throat> but I'm already a little dismayed that the author didn't consider at all Thoreau's longest botanical expedition. And that's, of course, his trip to Minnesota in 1861. Henry's field notebook from the Journey West is filled with pages of plant inventories from Goat Island at Niagara Falls, from his months spent on the Minnesota prairies, and from his week on Mackinac Island at the top of Michigan. And yes, this is my special area of expertise and my special area of interest, and evidently the author didn't read my book on the Minnesota Journey. Oh well, there's a lost opportunity if you ask me. Fortunately, I know somebody else who is doing some more investigations along these lines, and we might be talking about that one in, a, in the future. So Thoreau's botany, good stuff anyway, I'm sure, covering his studies of botany from 1850 to 1862, except sadly without the journey west of 1861. And the last of our six main books here is Tramping Monadnock New Discoveries with Henry David Thoreau by Robert M. Young. Bob is a friend of mine. I've known about his research on Thoreau's Monadnock trips for many years. We've had many discussions about it. I read early versions of this manuscript Together we hiked Monadnock and some of the trails of the past railroads that Thoreau took to and from the mountain. But Bob has hiked the routes many times. And here he considers all four of Thoreau's trips to Mount Monadnock in southern New Hampshire. Past scholars have posed theories about where Thoreau and his friend Ellery Channing would have walked and where they would have camped each time. Bob has studied all the possibilities and the landscapes enough that he's pretty much nailed down the details. He also includes excerpts from Channing's journals, which are hard to get, because Ellery often visited Monadnock after his friend Henry was gone, in remembrance. So if you like the kind of books that allow you to follow yourself in Henry's footsteps, then this is the newest one for you, Tramping Monadnock by Robert M. Young. Thank you, Bob. And so these are the six books that were re released this year. As I said, they're all available from the Thoreau Society shop at Walden Pond, either in person or online. Links below. But of course, I've got more to talk about. Okay. Um, yes. What do we have next? Okay. A self-published book that you may be interested in that came out this year is called If the Row Had a Bicycle, The Art of the Ride by Mark Kramer. Mark is originally from the United States and has lived in France for a long time. Uh, he was inspired by Thoreau's habit of making daily walks, but Mark is instead inspired by 
bicycling. He is keen on bicycling, so he bicycles all around France and reports on the countryside, what he sees and everything. Takes us on 39 day trips in this book. And as you may imagine, this is a memoir. It's more about Mark and France than it is about Thoreau. But Thoreau was the premise for this book. And so if it strikes a chord with you, there you go. You may want to find a copy of If Thoreau Had a Bicycle. A book that I read this year and loved was American Ramble. <clears throat> A Walk of Memory and Renewal by Neil King Jr. I like to read books from people who have made walking expeditions and I made another video recommending some of the ones that I'd, writ I'd read um, beginning of course with Thoreau's essay Walking. In spring of 2021 journalist Neil King decided to walk from Washington DC to New York City um, through Maryland, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York in times when the nation was divided, to see what he could see, to see how people were doing, and also to see what he was feeling after surviving a bout with cancer. This was a noble under effort to undertake. Um, spring of 2021, we were still lingering with the pandemic, um, so there was that added uh, challenge to the, to the task. It took him 25 days. Neil cites Thoreau a number of times in the book, even though this journey was not singularly inspired by Thoreau's habit of walking, okay? And when Neil got to northern New Jersey, he especially wanted to find the Eagleswood property that Thoreau was paid to survey in Perth Amboy in 1856. This is one of the few times when somebody has done this. Now, friend Wayne Diltz, a Thoreau Society member from New Jersey, went to the same place and wrote about what he found a while ago. You can find Wayne's article in his book Thoreau Vienna. But for a casual bystander or a random journalist, so to speak, to decide to detour to see Perth Amboy and to see where Thoreau was, that is something different. And the whole book is intriguing, especially if you're like me and you're from one of the places that he walks through and you You've spent time in some of these places. That's American Ramble by Neil King Jr. Now, here's a tangent to follow into fiction. Fiction, yes, fiction. Uh, because last year, in 2022, we had Amanda Flowers' book, Because I Could Not Stop for Death. Okay. <clears throat> you probably can figure out who the main character is in this historical fiction mystery novel, right? Because I Could Not Stop for Death is the first line of a poem by Emily Dickinson. Okay, so the year is 1855, January 1855. This book features Emily Dickinson as an amateur detective in her hometown of Amherst, Massachusetts. She teams up with her maid, Willa Noble, uh, when in this one, when Willow's younger brother is unfortunately accidentally killed. Was his death really an accident or was somebody really responsible? These are the questions that Emily asks and she drags Willow into an, a, a, an amateur investigation and they're looking for the answers. And you may say, why are you even mentioning this, Kareen? Emily Dickinson is not a transcendentalist. Amherst is not conquered, yada, yada, yada. This is historical fiction. It's a mystery. You know, you're right. It's all too true. But the second book in the series came out just a little bit ago, and it's called I Heard a Fly Buzz When I Died. Again, first line from a poem. This one is set in August of 1856. This one may interest you more because... Amherst is all agog that Mr. Ralph Waldo Emerson from Concord is coming to speak at a literary uh, seminar session at Amherst College. Wow! Cool beans. And he is accompanied by his personal secretary, Luther Howard. Okay, yeah, this is fiction. Okay. They will be staying with Austin Dickinson, Emily's brother, okay, right next door to the big yellow house, you know Amherst, okay. Willa thinks, the maid, thinks that Emily should show 
Emerson some of her poetry uh, and should approach him in, in that way. At the same time, Emerson's secretary, Luther Howard, seems to be doing some approaching of his own onto Emily and her sister Lavinia, especially Lavinia, maybe courting her, okay, which could be exciting, except that in this mystery <laughs> episode, what do you know, unfortunately, Luther comes to his own demise. Uh-oh. Okay, can Emily and Willa solve this mystery too? That's I Heard a Fly Buzz When I Died, and the first book in the series was Because I Could Not Stop for Death. I like these books. They're a lot of fun. Of course, not for the characters that get offed, but, you know. And if you know Emily Dickinson, if you know Amherst, you can tell that they're as historically accurate as you can, can get and still be fiction, okay? I hope there are more of these. Amanda Flower, please don't let this series die. Okay. So that's it for the books that came out in 2023 that I know of. If you've self-published another one or if you know any more, comment below. Tell us more. Um, what do we know about what books are coming out in 2024? Well, Barry Andrews will have a new book coming out at the end of March. You probably know that Barry has given us a number of quote books and self um, self-guided study guides uh, for reading Thoreau and Emerson and the Transcendentalists, right? Okay, so the one coming out in March is going to be the Gospel According to This Moment, the Spiritual Message of Henry David Thoreau. Here, Barry's going to focus on religion, which is, of course, his specialty. And according to the official book description, he's going to explore the nature of Thoreau's spiritual message what he called the gospel according to this moment, which enables a flourishing and deliberate life. Barry shows us that Thoreau can be a spiritual guide who can teach us an alternative way of being religious in the world. In March, gospel according to this moment. By Barry Andrews. And then another book edited by Jeff Wisner is scheduled to come out in May. Jeff already gave us Throws Animals and Throws Wildflowers. Uh, you may remember these. These are extensive uh, quote books from the journals, and then they also have illustrations, pen and ink illustrations. Well, along that same theme, in May, we are going to get a year of birds, writings of birds from the journals of Henry David Thoreau. You assume that it will follow the same pattern as those two other books, even though they're, it's going to have another publisher. This one will have 150 color illustrations by Barry Van Dusen and a foreword by Thoreau Society's very own Peter Alden, international bird expert Peter Alden. So, something to look forward to in May, A Year of Birds, edited by Jeff Wisner, with illustrations by Barry Van Dusen and foreword by Peter Alden. Now, additionally, I want to show you, this is not coming out this year, this is not coming out next year, <clears throat> but I want to share with you a book that you may come upon in your search for all things Thoreau or all things Walden, and I want to tell you about it so you can decide whether you want to get it or not, all right? <laughs> you may turn up with a funky little book. It doesn't have much to do with Thoreau at all, except as a tangent in the title, and it's called What Do You Hear From Walden Pond by Jack Douglas. Evidently came out in 1971 in hardback. This is the 74 paperback with the provocative uh, image on the title. A guy uh, writing on a typewriter in a pool with all kinds of um, scantily clad people behind him, right? Okay. Came out in 74. <clears throat> Jack Douglas was a comedy writer. He had been one for 25 years, and then he, he gained a new young family. They moved to the remote country of bush country of northern Ontario to get away from it all. Not because of Henry David Thoreau, but just to get away from Hollywood. Two years later, Jack got a call to return to Hollywood to write a script for a television movie. <clears throat> and after lots of deliberation and thought, he decided to take the job 
move his whole family back to Los Angeles. So the majority of the book is about him dealing with the demands of strong personalities in the business and celebrities, as well as living in a major metropolitan area after years of being in the wild. Everybody knew that he had come back from the outback, so to speak. So at a Hollywood party one night, someone who had already been drinking a little bit turned to him and said, what do you hear from Walden Pond? And Jack replied immediately, they got big trouble up there. Thoreau just killed his agent. <laughs> so the guy didn't know what to do in response and wasn't sure what, what Jack meant or whether he was serious. So anyway, <clears throat> that's the whole of Thoreau in the book, except for the dedication. <laughs> the dedication says, to Henry David Thoreau, who said, the spending of the best part of one's life earning money is a questionable pursuit. Work again. And to J. Paul Getty, who said, huh? <laughs> and then on the back it says, Life in the serene Canadian wilds may be everyone's dream, but too many murmuring pines can soon drive a man thoroughly mad. T-H-O-R-E-A-U hyphen L-Y mad. So when Jack Douglas got an offer to write comedy material for a top Hollywood comic, he grabbed it. Okay. Uh, so... It's told with sarcasm, sardonic wit. He's a comedy writer, and it's the kind of book that you find in the 60s that's about the business. Um, you'll zip right through this one uh, if you get it uh, accidentally or deliberately. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, kind of, it's, it's a lot of fun, too. It's, it's revealing about what the, what the business was like um, back in the late 60s. And remember, this was a time when Thoreau was coming to the forefront in quotes on posters and, you know, um, anniversary books uh, in the 60s on his death. This is, the 60s were a, a reinvigoration of his reputation. And so it's not unusual that somebody would use What Do You Hear from Wall and Pond as a comedy book title, right? Okay. Just warning you in case you get it. Thank you, Jack Douglas. So <clears throat> that wraps up our new books for 2023. Again, if you know of others, please write them in the comments below. I'm Corrine Smith. Now, go read some of this great stuff, okay? <laughs> I've given you a lot of options here. <laughs> go read. <laughs>